Less than one month after the release of its first public beta, the next version of Daggerheart, version 1.3, has been released, and with it comes a host of improvements to the game that run the gamut from quality of life changes to actual functional adjustments that help make the game feel a bit more seamless. But that's certainly not to say that it's all perfect, which is to be expected. This is still a beta and is still intended to be in playtesting, so the game isn't perfect because it isn't supposed to be yet. It's still a work in progress. It is really important to keep that in mind throughout all of these discussions. The purpose of this video will be to highlight some of the major changes that have come with version 1.3 and discuss both the good and the bad as necessary. The first thing that I want to touch on isn't so much a change as it is a note, but it's something that I've seen brought up in nearly every Daggerheart video that I've come across so far, and that's the length of the document. The first public playtest manuscript, version 1.2, was 377 pages long, and everyone points to this as something of a huge disconnect between what the game presents itself as, a more rules-light, free-flowing game, and the reality of this massively long document. The point that I want to make about this is that we don't know what form or package Daggerheart will actually take when it releases. The reality is that much of what is combined in this playtest manuscript is information that would end up in a Dungeon Master's Guide or a Monster Manual, and not all in a player's handbook if we're using the Dungeons and Dragons terms here. Now, as mentioned, we have no idea if they plan to release this as one massive book, or if they intend to split it up. My inclination is that they'll probably split it up, which obviously does still equate to the same amount or possibly even more pages, but at least it becomes much less daunting and more digestible to pick up as a player or DM even. Now, that being said, version 1.3 is shorter at only 316 pages, but that is likely because they removed many monster stat blocks for some refinement purposes. I do also think that so much of what is written in the book can be massively condensed and made shorter. They spend an inordinate amount of time explaining that most of the rules in the game are that there aren't any rules, which is kind of funny. I understand why they're doing this though. They're trying to communicate their design intent throughout the text with the assumption that people are not coming from a more rules light or free flowing games, and it shows. To their credit though, they do state that the text hasn't been through an editor yet, so I am confident that much of the text will become cut down, easier to parse, less repetitive, and just shorter over time. But I'll get to more of this a little bit later on. Alright, let's talk about some actual changes. I'm currently on a quest to hit 10,000 subscribers by the time that the revised D&D Player's Handbook comes out in September. So if you like what I do and want to help me reach that goal, a sub to the channel would be amazing. Shout out to all of my members as usual, Julian in the Champion tier, Jackal3 and Jumpy Sonic Bear in the Hero tier, and Julio, SirenXY, BrainLaborks, Nathan, and D&D Unoptimized in the Warrior tier. Your support really means a lot and I can't thank you all enough. If you'd like to help me out for as little as $1 per month to get access to shoutouts and early videos, click the join button. Thanks. The first thing that I want to go over is one of the biggest talking points from the initial public release of Daggerheart, and that is combat, and specifically, initiative. In version 1.2, the rules for initiative, that being how turn order is decided, is that there's basically no rules. Turns were to be decided naturally and what was dictated by the fiction. If it made sense for you to go, you go. If it made sense for you to sit out most of a combat, you can. No one is forced to do anything. Players can work together to chain and form ideas that can be executed simultaneously, or just follow the narrative flow of how the encounter itself is playing out. It should be clear that Daggerheart is far from the first tabletop game to do this though. However, given that many of the people interested in this system are likely fans of Critical Role, and most of their exposure to tabletop role-playing games has been exclusively Dungeons and Dragons, this definitely created something of a natural point of contention among many. How would this actually work in play? Now, like I said in my playtest review video, it works well, probably better than you would expect. I still prefer the more rigid and structured system that exists in D&D, but I can see the advantages that a more open-ended and less strict system has to offer. So in version 1.3, it looks like the designers have been listening, and they've created a new optional rule for turn-based initiative. The way this works is that when the action tracker comes into play, players can then each take three action tokens and place them on their sheet. They then still proceed as they normally would in that they still decide in real time who goes when. No dice are rolled to determine order. Instead, each character now essentially has a limit on how many things they can do before another player can go. A player can potentially take as many as three actions before passing play, but it is recommended that before taking more than one consecutive action, that they see if someone else wants to do something. 
Once all characters have used all three of their tokens, if the encounter is still going, they all refill back to three and then just repeat the process. I'm not sure how I feel about this. I think that even though it addresses one of the problems with the system, that being the concern over one player hogging the spotlight, it doesn't address what I think most people's concern actually was, which is the real-time determination of who goes and when. Now, it's clear why they did this. They didn't want to lose that fluidity that combat is intended to have in the game, but I'm just not sure how helpful this rule is going to be. I will say I haven't actually tried using it yet, but I would be curious to see how it plays out versus the standard initiative rule. The next major change is related to how GMs gain fear. In Playtest 1.2, whenever a player rolled with fear, regardless of whether or not the roll was a success or a failure, the GM would gain a fear and have the option to make a move if that made sense. Making a move can be anything from showing a player how their action impacted something around them, or asking that player a question, or maybe even starting an encounter. It all depends on the fiction at the time. This led to a lot of concerns from the community about how easy it is for the GM to have access to both consistent and large quantities of fear, which they felt skewed the game against them. This was a particularly loud consideration in combat scenarios where many players voiced their opinion that it could be just better and make the most sense for certain characters to essentially opt out of the encounter entirely and just do nothing as they may end up providing the GM with just too much fear. In 1.3, this has received a significant change. Now, whenever a player rolls with fear, the GM has the option to either make a move or take a fear, not both. As an aside, this isn't actually all that clear in the rules text itself, but instead is made much more clear by the changelog. I'll talk about clarity a bit later though. Anyway, while this change might seem small, the impacts are actually significant. Firstly, GMs are encouraged to make moves rather than take fear. This on its own has an impact on how they are able to accumulate fear, but now it also adds an additional step whenever anything is happening in the game, which is, as per the rules, supposed to be constant. Things are always supposed to be happening. I've discussed in past videos how I think that GMs for Daggerheart will struggle to some degree while learning the game, in that there are just so many options that you always have to consider, and now another choice has been thrown in. So, whenever anything happens now, you need to have a response for a success or failure with hope, a success or failure with fear, a critical success, and then if the results are one of the two options with fear, you need to decide whether you want to make a move or take a fear. It just adds an additional step to the flow that can result in the game feeling less fluid than it's actually intended to be. In combat though, I feel like the impacts are bigger. As a reminder, players generally decide amongst themselves who's going and when. However, the GM can make a move in any of three situations. When a player rolls with fear, if a player fails a roll, or if it makes sense in the fiction, by spending to fear. The thing is though, that gaining fear in the midst of combat now feels like it will be an extremely difficult thing to do. Given that in only one of those circumstances the GM even has the opportunity to take a fear, and now they need to decide whether to take it or not, and considering that they are encouraged to make a move rather than take fear, I just feel like it loses a lot of its usefulness in combat. A GM almost needs to start the encounter with a large amount of fear stored to be able to do many of the cool things available to their adversaries and the new environments, which we'll get to. And in the case where a player does roll with fear, the opportunity cost of not taking actions and instead taking a fear and then just passing play back to the players seems like a bit of a feels bad moment that will lead to combat being even more in the player's favor than it already is. I know that in acknowledgement of this, the team has lowered the fear cost on a lot of adversary moves, but I still feel pretty conflicted on this change overall. The GM being able to spend two fear to interrupt the players was already a pretty high cost, and now it feels like it'll almost never be used unless you just happen to enter combat while sitting on something like six fear. Maybe that's okay, maybe it's not, I I'm not sure yet. I will be playtesting 1.3 this week, and I am really curious to see how this all plays out in practice. Another major change is how damage thresholds and armor work. I've already made an entire video specifically about this, so I won't go into full detail here, but I will go over the main points. 
If you're curious to see a much more detailed discussion of this, I'll link my video in the description and in the end cards. All classes now start with 6 armor slots and all damage thresholds have seen adjustments across the board. Stress has also been decoupled from damage entirely, meaning that everyone's minor damage threshold now begins at 1 and there is no option to take stress instead of damage. I still love the idea of damage thresholds. I think they're an interesting twist on how damage is typically conceptualized in games. What I'm not so sure about is just how much sense they make in Daggerheart. They feel like they add an extra complication to the impacts of this otherwise supposedly narrative flow of combat. Removing stress from the equation helps in that there is one less consideration to make, but it doesn't help that you still have to decide whether to use your armor or not, something that your character is physically wearing. It's all just a bit odd. Anyway, since the adjustment of damage thresholds and armor effectiveness in the game, it has created some interesting scenarios where technically worse armor is often equivalent in performance or even better since it comes with no downsides as compared to heavier armor. The problem with this isn't necessarily that the disparity exists, but rather that the disparity is so opaque and the only way to uncover it is through a lot of trial and error or by making charts, which again feels quite contradictory to the type of game that Daggerheart is looking to be. Again, I'll leave the full discussion on this link below. Another significant mechanical change was to the advantage and disadvantage system in the game. Previously, rolling with advantage allowed you to roll an additional d6 and add it to the total while disadvantage had you subtracting it. Now, when you roll with advantage, you roll an extra hope die and choose the higher number rolled. However, if you do roll a critical success, that being your hope die matches your fear die, you get the crit regardless of the die that rolled it. So even if you're lower of the two hope dies crit, you still get to pick that one. Rolling with disadvantage still grants you an additional hope die, however you now have to pick the lower value. It's worth noting that when rolling with disadvantage, if your higher roll on the hope die would crit, you don't get it. You still need to pick the lower value. Statistically, this doesn't change all that much when rolling with disadvantage, at least as far as critically succeeding goes. You still got your roughly 8% chance to crit. However, when rolling with advantage, this basically doubles to approximately 16%, which is a pretty massive jump. I think the adjustments to advantage and disadvantage feel more fitting in the game now and less abstract. I like this change. It is worth noting that it's not very hard in Daggerheart to have sources of advantage on rolls, and given that the dice are already skewed in the player's favor in terms of rolling with hope at approximately 60% of the time, this will make that even higher. Though there are many other smaller scale changes, including class feature rebalancing across the board, the last thing I wanted to talk about was actually a new inclusion, and those are environments. To quote the text, environments are anything in a scene that is not the PCs or the adversaries. It goes on to say that environments and adversaries are built to interact and support one another, both mechanically and narratively. What environments ultimately amount to are just locations. They are stat blocks for a given area that are designed to help the GM make a location come to life and help support the running of that area. This can include things like traps, the types of adversaries that you might see there, a chance meeting, or how people around them might be influenced by the group's actions. For example, the Baronial Court environment has a reaction called Gossip, which states that when a character fails a presence role in that environment, they need to mark a stress as their failure becomes the hot gossip for the night. This is a fun twist that adds a layer of authenticity to a location. The players are in this place and what they do matters. People overhear them, traps exist, enemies might be present. It's a great aid for a GM to use to be able to have a quick reference point. Here's the thing though, and this might be something of a hot take. I love the idea of environments. They seem really interesting and fun, but again, I can't help but feel like to some degree they feel out of place in Daggerheart. Hear me out. Firstly, I get it. I understand that they are not intended to be something that is just ripped from the text and placed in the middle of the game, though technically they can be, nothing is stopping you. But the point is, they're more designed and intended to be something of a reference for GMs. Something to use as a tool to aid in world building. To use when making your own environment. And while I am sure that some amount of people will certainly be using them that way, I can't help but feel like more people will just be using them straight out of the book, changing nothing, and in that sense, they almost fall victim to their own design. Instead of being a useful tool to help bring the world to life, it becomes another stat block to reference, another passive effect to remember, reactions to keep track of, fear usage to monitor. In a game that's trying to be more open-ended and loose, they have introduced a plethora of things to keep track of and use, but especially so during combat. 
In his review of the game, Bob Worldbuilder mentioned how at points during the game, he found he became so focused on the tactile and visual elements of Daggerheart that it took him out of the moment. It caused him to not really imagine things or describe them as he normally would, which is basically the exact opposite of what the goal for the game was supposed to be. And like he mentions, this is something that would probably get easier with practice and exposure, but it seems like a large point of the game was to allow for easy entry into it, and with every new cool thing that gets added, it makes that entry point just that much harder to reach. I think I just struggle to see what the end game is here for environments. Are we going to get an environment manual, something akin to a monster manual? Hundreds and hundreds of pages dedicated to locations? Will this be something that third party publishers pick up on and print? Will we be getting massive supplements that are entirely location based? This feels like an unending and unreachable goal in a game that is also trying to design hundreds of enemies at the same time. Creating an exhaustive set of environments feels like an ironically exhausting task. Now, I'm sure they don't plan to do literally everything, but nothing is stopping them from just continuing to create more environments. From where I'm sitting, I think a simpler implementation of the environment system would be to just have tables of passive, active, and reaction and fear examples rather than actually trying to have them fit around a specific environment. This serves the goal of letting GMs pick and choose what makes sense to them without feeling beholden to a certain location and just makes their own development so much easier. Potentially, these could also be used in campaign setting or adventure type books to really help get a sense of the world that has been created for players. Again though, it's really that I'm just not sure what the end goal really is. The final point that I want to make is just about the overall length and clarity of the book, like I touched on at the beginning. I found getting through the GM side of this text to be very challenging. There's so much duplication from the player side, there's so many examples that often aren't clear and make things more confusing. Like in the story is consequence section, where it says that a good use of succeeding with fear would be to have someone succeed in unlocking a door, but then they're spotted. But then here, in the avoid undermining success section, where it says that a bad way to succeed with fear would be to have characters successfully sneak through a hallway only to get spotted. <laughs> Which is it? I get that there's different contexts in each scenario, but this just makes it so much harder to get to grips with the guidance that the text is actually trying to offer. And before anyone comments it, yes, I know, rulings over rules, I get it, we all do. But that doesn't mean that the text should be ambiguous to the point of contradicting itself. This might be someone's first TTRPG, and they should be able to understand the intent of the game given the text, even assuming zero experience. I truly feel like the GM section could probably be one quarter of the length and still deliver the same amount of information, and it would probably be even more clear. Like here in the Gaining Fear section. It reads, whenever a PC rolls a fear, you have the opportunity to gain a fear instead of making a GM move. This is only clear because the changelog was very explicit about it. This section could just as easily read, when a PC rolls a fear, you can either gain a fear or make a move. That's it. This is just one small example, but I assure you that the text is littered with this. Overall, I do like the general direction that Daggerheart is heading with version 1.3, though I do feel like there is something of an identity crisis happening. Like I mentioned, there are a few areas where I'm raising some yellow flags, but I'm just not sure how well they'll play out, and even if I like them in isolation, I'm just not sure how well they fit the theme and goal of the overall system that Daggerheart is, but that still remains to be seen. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to help me reach that goal of 10,000 subs by September. I also try and release a D&D video every Friday and something from another TTRPG on Sundays. Let me know your thoughts on Daggerheart and the 1.3 update in the comments below, but otherwise, take care.